This is Leland Snyder for Frack Times. So if you listen to Commissioner Joe Martin's testimony, he constantly dodges a question about whether the public will have feedback to this secret study on secret data with secret instructions given to the DOH of what they can do as far as make rules. Dr. Shaw, head of DOH, said very clearly that he was only allowed to do mitigation and surveillance. He was not allowed to judge if fracking is safe for New York. Martin constantly testifies that this isn't a decision of whether it's going forward or not, as far as the review is concerned. It's simply a matter of writing rules. So let's listen in and see what he has to say. Um, and just before I turn to questions, I just wanted to introduce the staff that's with me here today. Ian Reynolds is the Deputy Commissioner for Administration and Finance. Mark Grisman is my Executive Deputy Commissioner. And Julie Kai is the Director of Legislative Affairs. Uh, the first questioner will be the Chair of the Environmental and Conservation Committee, uh, Mark Rosanti. Thank you, uh, Senator DeFrancisco. Uh, Commissioner Martins, good morning. Good morning. Uh, I have a few questions for you. Uh, uh, can you tell us uh, in your statement that you just had, that there wasn't any mention, can you tell us what the status is on the health impact studies that are being done and the final SGIS report with regards to uh, high volume hydraulic fracturing? Yes, I'll just reiterate uh, what Commissioner Shaw said last week, which is he is um, conducting a health review of our uh, supplemental generic environmental impact statement, and it ought to be completed in a few weeks. And then when that particular report is completed, then that will be added to the, uh, the final SGIS report. Is that completed as of yet? It's not completed until we hear back from uh, Commissioner Shaw. When we do, that will be added to the SGIS. Okay. Now, on another area, you know, I'm concerned that the budget contains language that puts the state at jeopardy. I think you're, you, you know about this, of losing uh, federal funds earmarked for the conservation fund. And this has been an ongoing issue for a few years. Uh, an audit by the U.S. Department of Interior found that it needs to be fixed or we're going to lose this federal aid. Uh, are you, naturally I know you're aware of it, I mean, what are we going to do to correct this problem? Uh, language is included in the budget that uh, we believe corrects the problem, uh, although I did hear recently that the Fish and Wildlife Service has some concerns about the language which they had agreed to last year. Um, so we're going to continue to work with Fish and Wildlife and sort that out as quickly as possible. Obviously, we all want to see that language included in the budget so we don't put any federal uh, funds at risk. Okay. And, uh, and I know that your office is going to work with my office as well as the Assembly to make sure that we get that done uh, uh, this session. Yes, absolutely. Okay. On a different subject, does the uh, proposed budget uh, including and include any funding related to the authorization of hydrofracking, such as uh, increased permit revenue or increased staff levels? No, it does not. So does the absence of that funding mean that the department does not plan to finalize the SGI and or issue permits during the coming fiscal year? It is really uh, up in the air. The Department of Health should be getting back to us shortly on its review of the SGIs. So it was premature uh, in our judgment to include funds when we weren't at the, end of, at the end of the process. Well, you have a couple of deadlines coming up in February. Um, do you anticipate an ability to meet those deadlines if the uh, Health Department hasn't submitted its study? It all depends on what the health review says. Uh, it, if it recommends additional uh, measures, then it's, it would be difficult to finalize and get the regulations finalized. So it really depends on what the Commissioner Shaw recommends to the department. Do you, given that fact, um, I'm wondering if you are willing then to consider the results of a new uh, University of Pennsylvania study on the issue, which is going to um, investigate and analyze reports of uh, health problems uh, near fracking operations in Pennsylvania. Is that uh, something that, uh, you know, or let me ask, is that, is that not information that we should have before things are finalized? 
it's um, it, you know we commit we consider every study any new information that comes down the pike and, and it seems on this issue that it almost does daily uh, I think the University of Pennsylvania study is not fully funded yet so I'm not sure what the timetable is for that I know a lot of um, universities have agreed to participate but I think there is still an open issue about timing and funding but it's certainly I, one we're going to watch carefully Okay, well, I, pre I know I understand and, and appreciate that comment, but um, and I mentioned that one in particular only because it is taking place. It's an independent study that's taking place in a state that has experience with hydrofracking. And therefore, it seems to me that having any information from that study would be a valuable thing before we make any decisions on what we want to do. Would, would it not? It's, as I said, we. we we watch these studies very carefully regardless. I mean, the EPA study is still coming forward. We hope that, um, you know, we get some interim information back from EPA on that study as well, and we actually have two DEC staff that are participating in that uh, as uh, designees for the agency. Okay. Um, on the bottle bill, I have to ask you, uh, and you mentioned uh, the increased funding, which is great, but it's tied into these other changes some of which, as you know from past experience, we have concerns about. Uh, and one in particular is that it certainly appears to reduce, the, has the effect of reducing the number of um, stores that would be taking bottles back, which in, in turn, it seems to me, re reduces the effectiveness of the, the Bigger Better Bottle Bill. Uh, and I'm curious what your thoughts on that subject are. Well, we'd be happy to discuss your concerns. There's a long list of, you know, reforms in there that we hope will actually increase compliance and obviously uh, add to the revenue the state gets from the bottle bill. Uh, we know that there is a lot of fraud out there. We know there's problems with transshipping. Uh, there's problems with reverse vending machines. And cumulatively, they cost the state a lot of money, and it's unfair for the, the entities that comply with the bottle law. So the goal here is just increased compliance, increased return rates. But if there are specific concerns that you think would be, are counterproductive in our proposal, we're obviously happy to talk about them. Okay, great. We'd be happy to have that discussion with you. Great. Um, I have to ask you, because I get a lot of um, environmental groups that come into uh, my office and they say that uh, uh, they're told that the department's computers are the reason why they're having trouble properly monitoring speedies uh, permits and impl implementing the new uh, sewage pollution right to know act. So I guess I have to ask you, does the department have adequate computer resources in administration uh, of existing programs, including speedies and the sewage pollution right to know act? Uh, the short answer is no, but the good news is there are increased funds in this budget for uh, IT at the department. There's actually a total of $6 million uh, between the New York Works program and our capital budget for IT. Um, I have been saying very frequently in talks that I give that the department is in the 20th century, uh, stuck in the 20th century as far as technology is concerned. Uh, we don't have, you can't get a permit online, you can't submit reports online, you can't pay the department online except for fishing and hunting licenses. Um, I would very much like to bring DEC into the 21st century and allow all of this to be done online. So this is, this is a, an installment. It's not going to get us there, Assemblyman, but it's one of my highest priorities. So I would, I would agree. It, it, uh, it hurts our ability to be transparent, to get information to the public more quickly, and it is one of my highest priorities. Okay. In the 30 seconds I have left to me, can you give me a real quick thumbnail on what the $5 million in flood resiliency money in the EPF is intended to be for? It is for, you know, the soft sol solutions. It is uh, green infrastructure. It is uh, uh, wetland mitigation, uh, stream corridor protection, all of the things that can be done to um, lessen flood impacts, but not hard engineering. Uh, it's not for hardening structures. It's soft engineering solutions to flooding. Since I'm out of time, can you, uh, can you get to me information on how you intend, you're gonna, whether you're going to solicit RFPs or yes. exactly how you anticipate the money would be allocated? 
Uh, and also reminds me that a half a half million dollars out of the five million dollars would be used for plantings. Uh, we obviously lost a lot of trees and vegetation from Hurricane Sandy. Thank you. Senator Abella. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good, Good Senator. How are you? Um, you know, I appreciate the relationship that we've had as the ranker of the Environmental Conservation Committee in the Senate. And I, I think you've been doing a great job, except for the issue of hydrofracking, and that's what I really want to concentrate on. Excuse me, uh, just for the record, I think everybody sitting in this room knows where you stand on this issue. <laughs> And it's uh, it just is going to slow down the process, and everybody wants to hear uh, what the speakers have to say to the questions that are asked. Thank you very much, Commissioner. If you can go through uh, once again for me when you anticipate coming out with the SGIS uh, final and the health impact assessment analysis. We are not on any particular timetable. Uh, I am waiting for the report from Dr. Shah, which I asked for, and which uh, I understand. Uh, he is getting close to completing. So when we get that report, we have to evaluate it. And obviously, uh, it, that, is, that is the first thing we'll do. The, you know, the potential health impacts and Dr. Shah and the Department of Health's opinion about you know, what we've done in the SGIS is critical, or I wouldn't have asked Dr. Shah to do this separate review. We worked very closely with the Department of Health throughout the process, so it's not as if this was the first time they've done a review. But lots, lots of people, needless to say, around the state, uh, health professionals raised concerns about the adequacy of the SGIS. So they've taken a closer look. They uh, turned to three outside uh, experts in the field from three prestigious universities. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Dr. Shah's report. Um, we should have it in a few weeks, and then we'll decide what, where we go from there. I want to get back to that, but first I want to ask a related question. So everybody was under the understanding that the SGIS would be done in February. So are you saying that is not happening? I have to wait until I get the health report before we make any decisions about whether we move forward or not. Okay. So let's go back to the health impact assessment. What exactly are these three scientists looking at? They looked at the SGEIS, uh, in the entire document. Uh, everything was available to them. Uh, we had summarized for them the parts of the SGIS that applied to public health issues. So we summarized that for them. But they basically looked at the entire SGIS. How many pages in the SGIS actually relate to health impacts? I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, the, the, uh, because, the document is several thousand pages, but... But the whole document is. Right. But I mean, some of us feel that there was actually no health impact assessment in the SGIS. So that, so that in effect... Excuse me, you, uh, I just want you to know that the time you're clapping is eliminated from the time the good senator has <laughs> questions. So, so, so uh, what I said was, if you didn't hear it, the time in which you're clapping takes time away from the questioner who obviously you want to have asked questions. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, so my concern is that you've asked the Department of Health to look at those components of the SGIS which related to health, which was nothing, and you've asked the scientists to look at that as well, and they're reviewing nothing. Um, I, I think there's probably many members of the Senate and the assembly who have been asking for a health impact assessment, an independent health impact assessment that would really truly look at this issue. Um, you know, my concern is, and you know, you can respond, that these three scientists who are well known and qualified are looking at nothing. So they're going to come back with a report saying there's no problem because there's no data, there's no scientific evidence in the SGIS for them to look at. I would, um, I, I disagree with your characterization that there's n no health uh, impact review in the SGIS. I would argue that most of the SGIS is a health impact review and addresses health impacts, uh, the potential health impacts to both health and the environment. Um, we identified, I mean, if, if you read the document in 
chapter six, I believe it is, we identified all the potential uh, impacts, adverse impacts, and it was not uh, exclusive to the environment, it included public health impacts. We listed all the potential chemicals that could be used in the process. And then we, the, the approach was to uh, see if we could identify specific mitigation measures, which is in chapter seven, that would prevent expo public exposure, human exposure, to the chemicals that are used in the process. <coughs> And not just chemicals, but there was lots of other impacts associated with uh, HVHF, clearing land, runoff. Um, you know, we address it from beginning to end. So the SGIS was very comprehensive. It did look at health impacts. And we asked the experts, these three experts from the outside, not just to look at the SGIS, but tell us if there were things we missed. So if they thought we if they think we miss things, I'm sure they'll be included in Dr. Shah's report. Uh, I'm glad you said that, but I wasn't here for Dr. Shah's testimony, but I don't think that's what he indicated, that, he, that they had the opportunity to suggest things that were missed. So, uh, you know, it, it seems that DEC is punting back to health, and health is punting back to DEC. So I, I think there needs to be a little clarification as to, and I'd like something in writing following up this meeting, if that is in fact the case, that the three scientists and the review can actually suggest things that were missed. And I just wanted to pick up also on your comment about mitigation. I would think when you do a health impact study, you would look at, is this the proper way to go to begin with, and then if it is, what mitigation is necessary. It's sort of like you put the cart before the horse saying, you're already going to go ahead with this, and now you're going to look at how you can mitigate the possible health impacts. I would think that's the wrong way to go. I'm not sure I follow you. We, we, In other words, you've already made a decision based upon what you just said to me. You've already made a decision that no matter what the health impacts are, we're going to find ways to mitigate it rather than should we do this based upon the possible health well, I, impacts. I think Exactly the opposite. I think we identify the potential adverse impacts and we explore whether or not they can be mitigated. And we proposed a lot of mitigation measures. We're asking, I asked Dr. Shaw, to look and see whether they agreed that the, the measures we proposed are adequate or if we missed any. And we did ask that question. And that's what the question that was asked of the experts. Did we miss things? Were there impacts to public health that we did not address in the SGIS? So, uh, I think we we fundamentally disagree about uh, the approach. We definitely there was no, fundamentally there was no disagree. There's no foregone conclusions in this process. Uh, two other questions, if I have time left. One, has there been any effort to identify any seismic impacts yes. that hydrofracking can call? And um, where is that? Uh, the New York City, in particular, raised lots of questions about the potential seismic impacts of fracking on the uh, water supply tunnels, and we hired an outside independent expert to look at that issue. Uh, we obviously looked at, you know, um, reports, outside reports that have been done about incidences in Ohio, uh, incidences in uh, England where seismic impacts have occurred. So we've looked at them and we've had an outside uh, consultant we, look at them as well. Is that coming out? I, I haven't seen anything like that. I'd like to see a copy of what you've been able to it, ascertain. It was in the, it's in the next draft that we've been working on. In the on. next draft. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the updated uh, SGIS was released in December, if I remember correctly. Um, prior to that, you had received about 80,000 comments, um, and it took you a year to analyze those 80,000 comments. And I understand there's about 200,000 comments that have come in since December. Right. How are you handling reviewing those 200,000 comments? It's kept people very busy. <laughs> Well, if it took you, what's your time frame? I mean, again, going back to that February deadline, which apparently is not a deadline, but it took you a year to do 80,000 comments, and now there are 200,000 comments, so. Um, there's 200,000 comments. I don't know how many of them are both germane to the, um, what we were seeking comments on, which was just the regulations that we proposed. Some of them obviously are just uh, repetitive comments. So there's lots of comments, and staff is literally 
working on responding to those comments right now, and lots of staff are working on them. Liz, question, absolutely. Um, will the health impact assessment that you're doing or anal uh, analysis um, be open to the public, and will it be uh, the public have an opportunity to comment? When it's released, I'm sure it will be made available to the public. And an opportunity for the public to comment? We'll have to see when we get it. But it will be made available to the public, and I'm sure that people will comment on it, whether there's a formal comment period or not. Thank you, Commissioner. Yep. Thank you. With regard to fracking, I mean, agriculture is, one of, is the largest industry in this state, and the dairy industry is a big component of that. Have, have you considered doing a socioeconomic impact study on the impact fracking will have on the dairy industry, especially in light of our efforts to increase the important yogurt industry that, that we have in the state? Because I'm very concerned about how we, we support agriculture, and there's going to be an impact on, on the dairy industry. Mm -hmm. Have you explored that? We certainly looked at it in the generic environmental impact statement. Um, you know, one of the, uh, obviously, a generic impact, environmental impact statement is, uh, looks at things generally. It's common, you know, conditions, common uh, impacts, and in this case, uh, it, it, it's the appropriate mechanism, but we, and we looked at things like agriculture and the potential impact to agriculture. And in fact, there are a handful of very specific mitigation measures that are directed specifically at agriculture, agriculture to minimize the impacts. Um, it's the limitation of a generic imp environmental impact statement is that it, we don't know what sites will actually be developed and where. So you, you know, you, when and if this ever goes forward, you have to continue to look at those impacts. One of the things you want to do is uh, make sure that the communities are actually involved, the communities that will know uh, if a well is proposed in a specific place, what those site-specific impacts will be. So this is only, you know, the first stage in the process, If again, if it goes forward. But agriculture is one of the concerns, and Ag and Markets was obviously involved with us uh, from the beginning of the process as well to try to anticipate and once again mitigate the impacts. But you could decide to do a socioeconomic impact <coughs> study. Well, we, we, we did in a generic, at, again, at a generic level for a statewide activity, there is a socioeconomic component, a very significant one to the but SGIS. You, you, you could be more specific and look at the agriculture, the impact on the agricultural industry or the dairy industry. We, we did. Okay. And when you, when you looked at that, did you take into account there was a study in Pennsylvania that showed that where there was active wells, there was a reduction in the number of, of cows producing milk. We did look at that. Um, once again, uh, it's, we hope it's a little bit like comparing apples to oranges when there's impacts in Pennsylvania. Impacts in Pennsylvania are under a spe very specific regulatory regime. We're proposed things that are very different than what has been done. For example, open impoundments are used for flow back water in places. We're not proposing to the use of open <coughs> impoundments. And open impoundments are a problem, and they that is one one specific you know possibility for a you know connection between agricultural impacts. Um, that again in New York we wouldn't allow that to, them to be used. In the in the health review study that Dr. Shaw is looking at, are they looking at the potential negative impact that fracking will could have on the food production? Like if there are cows that are near a gas well, if there is a breaker, if there is a tanker that uh, has an accident and fluid from the fracking process or, or materials that are used in the fracking process are spilled on land and the cows have access to it. Has, mm -hmm. Is anyone looking at the, how those chemicals that are used could potentially uh, be involved in the process of milk production? Mm -hmm. And is the health impact looking at the impact in that area? As I said, the, 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 em the emphasis and the approach 
that we proposed in the SDIS is to prevent exposure. It's to prevent spills. It's secondary containment systems. It's a whole series of things to prevent exposure in the first place. Can you eliminate them? No. Yes. Just like you can't elim you know, eliminate them in many I'm sorry, areas. I, 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 I'm sorry, I can't hear his answer. So. Go so ahead. The, what the health review is looking at is whether or not the, the mitigation me measures we propose to prevent exposure are adequate or not. That's what they're looking at. Okay, thank you. You are. Uh, we've been joined by some Assemblyman Brian Cavanaugh. Next to testify, Bill Scarborough, Assemblyman Scarborough. Good morning. Yeah. No. Hello? There we go. <laughs> uh, as I was saying, I'm from the uh, Jamaica St. Albans area, Southeast Queens. And you may or may not be aware of the huge flooding problem uh, that we have in that area. I know your region, two people are very much aware of it. Uh, the groundwater in our community has risen 30 or 35 feet within the last 15, uh, 20 years. And it has uh, damaged and, and threatened property throughout the area. Uh, our college, York College, is pumping hundreds of thousands of gallons of water per day and storing it out of their basement levels. Uh, we have churches, uh, senior citizen complex, bus depot, our subways uh, have been flooded by this water. We have hundreds of homes and businesses uh, whose basements have been rendered unusable simply by this rising water that is pouring into their properties. Uh, we have people pumping uh, private electric pumps 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They can never get their basements uh, dry because the water just continues to pump in. We have people who have mold spores on their wall the size of golf balls because of this constant water. Uh, a big cause of this is the fact that up until 1996, we were the last area to have private water. We had a company called Jamaica Water Supply. Water. Right. They were pumping roughly 60 million gallons of water per day for distribution. It had a secondary effect of keeping the water level low. <clears throat> 1996, New York City purchased Jamaica Water Supply. They stopped using those wells and began to bring water down from upstate. That has allowed this water to rise and to recharge, and so now it's a constant threat throughout our community. Um, we have been meeting with uh, New York City DEP and with uh, New York State DEC, Senator Smith, myself, the elected official, civics, uh, clergy in the community, to try to find a solution to this. In our view, the most immediate solution is to begin to repump those wells. That water has to be extracted out of the ground. It has to, the level has to be lowered so it stops threatening the properties. Uh, there has been a refusal to begin to repump those wells, even though there is a plan to start to repump them in 2018 when the Delaware Water Tunnel is shut down, and this then becomes an alternative water supply. Right. In the meanwhile, the people and businesses and institutions in our community are being flooded out. A uh, couple of questions. One, is there any funding? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Gibson. Thank you, uh, Commissioner, for being here today. As a senator who has a district that is uh, right along the Hudson River, I have a great respect for what you and your department do. Thank you. Um, I do, however, have uh, questions in regards to the work that you've done on hydraulic fracturing. Um, the SGIS report and the economic assessment report, do you have an estimate of what the work you did on those reports may have cost the taxpayers? Um, it's in the millions of dollars. I don't have the precise number, but I'm happy to get it for you. But it's, it's in the high millions of dollars, I would guess. It would be in the high millions, I would guess. What's high millions? Well, over 50. No, I don't think so. No. No, I think it's millions of dollars. I think it's several million dollars. Okay. It's well, I would think that it would be reasonable to think that for several million dollars, we would be able to have an accurate assessment of what the impacts, the negative impacts of hydro hydraulic fracturing would be on our tourism industry. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that we have that uh, information? 
Uh, the SGIS did look at impacts on tourism, mostly from anecdotal evidence in Pennsylvania and other places. Um, and the, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Pennsylvania has a very different tourism industry than New York does. I mean, as you know, it's one of our biggest industries. Right. Um, I would expect for the amount of money that we've spent so far, it would be realistic to think that I could go back to my constituents and my uh, tourism organizations and say, this is uh, what the cost of hydrofracking will be on your industry. Do we have that type of information? It's hard in a generic environmental impact statement to get um, that level of specificity because we don't know exactly where the activity is going to be undertaken, where the wells will actually be located, or how many wells will actually um, come into New York. Well, tourism is just one example. What about for our police and fire departments? Do I have information within this study that allows me to go back to my police and fire departments and? educate them what the cost will be to uh, their budgets with the negative impacts of hydraulic fracturing? Again, it's mostly anecdotal because the activity hasn't happened in this state. So we do know what's happened in other states and it's not, again, it's not perfectly analogous because we have a very different or proposed a very different set of regulations than uh, have happened in other states. Excuse me, with all due respect, I'm confused. I would think that the purpose of the report would be to try to estimate what the impacts of the costs in our economy would be um, otherwise, I'm not sure what exactly we're studying in these reports. It does. In, in a general way, it does assess those costs. Well, I've read the reports, and it just seems that it glosses over a lot of these issues that I'm asking about. I am trying to find significant answers to them. So I, I appreciate your patience. Also, just in regards to uh, the negative impact on our roads and highways, um, by reading these reports, there doesn't seem to be a way to calculate what the impact would be on the state's budget for repairing the highways and roads. Is, uh, do, do you think that that information is important? Do you think that it might be of forthcoming? Course of course it's important. And if we had more specific information about the number of wells and where they were going to be actually located, then we could generate specific information. Well, I would, I would think within the, uh, within the report, you could maybe, you know, do some estimates saying, you know, if there were 10 wells in this part of the country, it might cost us this much to repair those roads. There would be, I mean, it seems like there would be reasonable ways to provide a very variety of scenarios, but, but I just don't see those when I read the report. It seems to be glaringly missing. It is a generic environmental impact statement. It is not intended to generate specific activity because, again, once again, we don't know the specifics about how it will or if it will develop in New York. But there is a 251-page economic assessment report as a part of that, and only seven pages of that really address any of the issues that I'm talking about right now. The previous draft. Uh, I appreciate your patience to answer these questions. I just have uh, just uh, one more question. Uh, the, do, are we clear on exactly what chemicals are in the fracking water? There is a list, an exhaustive list in the SGIS of the potential chemicals that could be used. I think we list up to 350 chemicals very specifically. Um, since we don't have, we haven't uh, fracked a high volume well in New York, we don't know what they would use specifically in New York, but we'd require them to give us that both before and after a frack job. So if we don't know exactly what chemicals will be used to frack a well in New York, do, do the scientists that are doing the current health study know what the chemicals are that would be used to frack a well in New York? Okay, uh, we're going to take uh, a recess very shortly and come back in about five hours if you want to do it that way. We're trying to get this done in a productive way. He's answering the questions. If you don't like the answers, you certainly don't have to like them. But at least give him the respect of answering them and the question of their respect of having the questions asked. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. The health experts had the SGIS in front of them, which listed all of the potential chemicals that we think could be used in New York State. Well, I, I guess my point is I'm trying to determine that in, in spending the amount of money that we're spending on doing these reports, if, if we don't know exactly what type of chemicals are going to be used, and if the scientists don't know exactly what type of chemicals are going to be used, then, then why are we spending millions of dollars to do a report, and how could it be effective if neither the scientists nor your department know exactly what type of chemicals would be used? We know all the potential chemicals that would be used, and we've listed all of those, and we've enumerated the type of uh, health impacts that are associated with those chemicals. 
So I'm not sure, again, absent actually having the experience in New York of um, having a high volume well frack, how we could possibly know that. What we do know is in other states what chemicals they use. Um, they would use some subset of the, of the chemicals that are listed in the SDIS. We're talking about an activity that hasn't happened here. So we can only use the information we have from other states. So I'm not sure what you're trying to get at. I'm, I'm just trying to get at how to justify spending this amount of money on a report that isn't actually delivering the results that we need. I and, don't uh, agree with that. Uh, but you've already assessment. said you don't know exactly what chemicals will Excuse be used. Excuse me a minute. Product. I think he said quite clearly that he won't know what chemicals a developer might use until an application is presented and the list that is on the report is an exhaustive list of chemicals that were used in other states. Now I think he's being very consistent and it's, it's, uh, I don't think it's correct to try to mischaracterize what he's saying. Well, I, 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 with all due respect, Mr. Chairman, I'm not trying to mischaracterize it. I'm just trying to get a, a clear answer. I, I, it seems like everything is based on a hypothetical situation. What because happens we don't in other have, states? We, we haven't allowed the activity right. in New York State. That's why it's hypothetical. Is the activity has happened in a dozen other states, and we use information from those those states to in, anticipate what might happen or be used in New York State. That's about as good as we can do in New York. Thank you for being here today, and thanks for being patient and answering the questions. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Assemblywoman Barbara Lifton. And, um, Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Fracking, 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 right? Uh, it's, you know, my constituents care about a lot of environmental issues, but these days uh, the main issue they care about is fracking. Yep. Uh, it's the main issue I care about. Yep. So I'll direct my questions there. And I want to continue the discussion of this health review that is obviously a big concern for people. Um, and, you know, what, what, what bothers me most about some of the questions this morning is that we're sitting here asking you, are, is the health review dealing with this? Are you looking at this? You know, we don't know what you're looking at. The legislators don't know what you're looking at. Um, and it speaks to the, it seems to me, and what we've said from the beginning, from the very first comments, that this whole process has made an awful lot of sense, has been built on a very shaky foundation, uh, where in the original scoping document, I think you'll acknowledge, I think you have acknowledged this morning, that health care issues, health issues are the issues that are paramount here. They're, this is why we really look at environmental issues, because we care about the impact on human health and, and animal health as well. Um, and yet, many comments, my comments and others, EPA uh, commented in a very strong way and said, we're not seeing an emphasis here, we're not seeing dealing the issue of, of health impacts in the first S guys. And again, probably because it wasn't in the original scoping document. You weren't there at the time, Commissioner. I don't want to lay that at your doorstep. Do you, do you, don't you think that that was a, a flaw in the original scoping document, that health impact should have been clearly not just insinuated, not just coming at it from some other angle, but what are the, what are the potential health impacts in New York? And, 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 and really start with that. What are the health impacts so that in the first S guys, it's out there for the public to actually look at? Mm -hmm. to, to date, we have not seen this after four years. Uh, we have not really seen a document. You're saying there is a document now, after several iterations, there's a document that's been put together at DEC and handed it to, to, to DOH, but none of us have seen it. Right. The, um, all that's been handed to DOH is our, the updates we've done to the, uh, the S guys that went out for public comment. Uh, I forget my dates, I'm sorry, I saw the one, but uh, we put out the last draft in September of 2011, at a pu public comment period, obviously uh, took thousands of comments and have been working on responses to those and changes to the document as a result of lots of public interest. Uh, and clearly, the expressions of concern about public health caused me to kind of redouble our efforts, go back to the Department of Health and have them look at this document again and involve outside experts. And I have a lot of you know, faith in Dr. Shah personally. It, um, 
I mean, I think we've been very responsive to the public's call for a deeper look at this as it, as it affects public health. I would say, though, that I think the SGIS, even the original document that the public saw, um, while it, 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 everything in it revolved around impacts to the environment and public health. And as I said, the, our emphasis from the beginning was always on how do you prevent exposures? How do you keep the chemicals away from the public, whether it's the chemicals that are mixed on site, uh, that flow back in the flow back water that ultimately have to go to, dispo to disposal. You know, we followed the pathways, all the places where there c was the potential for exposure, and then we tried to suggest the most uh, aggressive uh, mitigation measures possible to stop that exposure. So while there's lots of things, uh, lots of chemicals that are used in the process, the, there's potential for impacts if those chemicals are released. So our focus was on don't let them be released. And this is, you know, and we laid out literally dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of mitigation measures that were, that emphasized that. But clearly, after that whole process, the public health community was not satisfied with what we had in the document. Uh, they called for a, a, a health impact assessment. We feel that, that the SGIS has been the rough equivalent of a health impact assessment because it involved lots of uh, public input at you know, a variety of stages. We've had 14 public hearings of one sort or another, four on scoping, four on the draft, uh, four, on the, uh, four on the 2009 draft, four on, more on the 2011 draft. So we've gotten a mountain of public comments and we've been trying to be responsive to those. Um, we've been working on the responses to comments and now the Department of Health is reviewing everything we've done and that will ultimately become a public document that the public can look at again. So uh, it's, it's, I'd rather that the Department of Health, you know, take a look at this and Dr. Shaw take a look at this and say, have, have you done enough? Does more need to be done? Are there gaps? And that's what I expect Dr. Shaw to report back to me shortly. So I think we have been responsive to the Assemblywoman. I know that, uh, you know, Obviously, there's plenty of critics, uh, many of them in this room. True. A and with all due respect, Commissioner, um, you know, you say it was in from the beginning, but EPA came out hitting the DEC very hard on, the fir on their first comment, saying it's not there. It wasn't there at the beginning. And many comments, and the second round of comments, still people, a great deal of concern, again, from the EPA, not satisfied either. But and, and uh, we, on the health we, impacts. We obviously took and, those and comments now, to heart. And now, you know, at the end, in the last four months, to say we're going to tag something on, uh, a health review, not a health, not a real health impact assessment, but a health review um, done apparently by DEC. Yeah. Who, the DEC had done, you said, we put together, I guess you put more stuff in the last document, again, stuff we haven't seen, you put together, because there was still criticism, you put together yet another or, or somehow coalesced, you know, took things out and took all this stuff out of the whole document, put it in one other document, eight pages, uh, as I understand it. And that's the health review. That was that sort that, of the health review that, done by DEC. But that's not, that's not the health review. The, the entire SGIS was okay. the health but review. But in order, in in order to get a focus on health issues, Right? That's, this is what's happened in the last few months. To get a focus on this, here's what we've done. Mm -hmm. This is what we're going to ask DOH and the outside experts from outside of our state, not the health experts inside New York State, but the health experts that have been brought in from outside uh, to look at. Um, so um, I'm, losing, I'm losing my train of thought. But, um, happens to me frequently. <laughs> Um, so, so my question to you is, I've, I've regained it, my question to you is, so if DEC did that, who, who is the health expert at DEC? I thought our health experts in doing health assessments or reviews are at DOH, and yet DEC, DEC did that. Who is it no, at no. DEC that it, basically put that document together, made, made the decisions about what, 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 it, what it was you had sure. done on, on health, on mitigating health impacts? First of all, starting from when I started here, and I can't obviously speak to prior to 2011, um, so put aside the 2009 draft, but since I've been here, DOH has been at our side. They've reviewed what we've reviewed. They helped draft parts of the SGEIS. 
So it's not, you know, that DEC has the independent health, you know, we're not writing the health part of this. We wrote it in concert with DOH. So, so they're reviewing their own review? I thought it, you were saying DEC put it together them, and handed it to we, DOH we, to look at. We asked them, I asked them to go back and look at it again and involve outside experts, which is exactly what they've done. They went to three very good outside experts, and th that's who's looking at it. So we did ask DOH to go back and say, take another look at this because of all the concerns that were raised. Uh, in the response to comments at public hearings. We heard it loud and clear. And that's why I went back to DOH and asked them to do this and asked them to engage outside experts. Again, with all due respect, Commissioner, it seems like a backwards process, a convoluted process, and it's certainly not a transparent process. It's a process that's I think it's been, been put on at the tail end to avoid some sort of criticism. I don't, I and it hasn't gone out to full um, public comment or review. We don't, I don't know what you're looking at. I'm a state legislator that's been following this issue for four but years. you will. You as will, my colleagues. But, but for comment, it's one thing to look at it. Sure, I understand it's going to be released at the end. Of course it's going to be released at the end. And are, is the public going to have an opportunity for public comment and review of this? I'm, of this I'm sure the public health. will comment on it. No, I mean, I mean formal public comment. I'm asking a serious we question. Of course they're going to comment. You, you know, we know they're deeply concerned about this, as, as are many of us. Um, is there going to be um, legal public uh, formal comment on this document, on I, in this I, health review? I don't know at this stage. I haven't seen the report yet. The re report could include a full range of things. It could, from, you know, one end of the spectrum that, no, we don't, we're not convinced you've done enough. Uh, they could be convinced you've done enough and conclude that it shouldn't happen in New York. That's one possibility. So until I see that, some woman I don't, I'm not drawing any conclusions about the need, even there may be no need for public comment, depending on what Dr. Shah says. Well, I don't think it's our state law in terms of scoping documents, critical issues, and, and, the, and the necessity of public involvement in that. We want, you know, we have experts all over the state, doctors, researchers, medical people, nurses, who've been looking at this stuff, and, and they don't get an opportunity to comment specifically on what you're doing. And uh, that doesn't seem good. It's, it, I think it's a very flawed process that's, uh, to me, unacceptable, and I think unacceptable to the majority of New Yorkers that have been looking at this. Thank you. Okay. So my time has run up, Commissioner. I'm sorry. Uh, have more thank, time. You thank you very much, Senator Kruger. Good morning. Good morning, Senator. You have a tough job. I'm not sure I'd want your job. Um, so when I look at the budget, is your budget going up or down? Because from your testimony, if you list out all this new money you're going to use, but I think you're actually taking a significant reduction in your budget. Can you confirm for me um, that your budget is approximately $187 million less than it was in 2012-13? I, I haven't done that math, Senator, but what I, what I can tell you is that the, the budget is flat. Um, it, discounting the cap, new capital money, the New York Works money, it, particularly there's $40 million in new New York Works funds. But on the state operating side, uh, remember that we, 74 employees were transferred to uh, information services, new department. So that money gets backed out. Uh, last year there was also some lump sums for uh, collective bargaining agreements that came into place. So those were basically one-time payments, but all of those, um, the increases that was part of those that um, is recurring is in our base budget. So I think when you net it all out, it may look like there's a reduction, but only because we've lost 74 employees to information services, and then there was some one-time expenditures last year that didn't carry forward because of the collective bargaining agreements that were settled. So, and I'm happy to, you know, run through the numbers. On okay, this. so I'll follow up with you later. Yeah. Um, but you are decreasing or zeroing out the invasive species pest management program, and is that not correct? No. 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 Okay. So the the ads for the Cornell Integrated Pest Management and Invasive Species has not been removed from the budget. No. No, oh, okay. You're drawing blanks because uh, okay, that program is carried forward. Okay, good, because I'm getting yeah. wrong information. Um, apparently, the federal government has pointed out we don't have adequate 
staffing for our shellfish inspection program. Um, can you tell me about that situation? I don't think they've said, I, I think they've raised concerns about the level of staffing. They haven't said that it's inadequate. I think they said you're right on the line. Um, in your testimony, you list out one of the items you're going to spend your $40 million from the New York Works Fund um, to address legacy orphaned and abandoned oil and gas wells. What does that mean, and how much are we spending? Uh, the total is $2 million. Um, the total in the New York Works Program is $2 million. This is for old oil and gas wells that were never properly plugged from before when DEC started regulating oil and gas drilling in New York. So we have hundreds if not thousands of old legacy wells that haven't been properly plugged. Uh, we have a $100 uh, permit fee that is charged to drillers when they come into New York now that goes into a, a fund that is supposed to be used to cap and, and close those old wells. Uh, we've had made very little progress. That money has been swept historically out of DEC's budget. So this is in recognition that we need to address those old legacy wells and close them properly. So how many we'll get to with this uh, is an open question because some may cost $5,000 to close, others may cost $50,000 to close. But we needed a, a significant sum of money and $2 million does this because when we put these uh, RFPs out to close these old wells, unless a, the type of business person that actually comes and closes these wells ha can work on a whole s slew of them at once, it wasn't worth their while pulling in all the equipment they needed to do a small job. So we put RFPs out and with the little money we've had in the past to do this, we, couldn't we didn't actually get any bids. So with $2 million, we think we will attract uh, a number of responsive bidders to the RFP and we'll actually get to close some of these wells. And if the state were to go forward with hydrofracking resulting in a large number of wells being drilled and the research shows that the rate of failure on those wells within a five, ten year period is pretty high, who would have responsibility for dealing with those wells? Would your agency be responsible? for taking care of them under a system like this? We'd, the, dr the, uh, the driller would be responsible for those wells. Sorry. So under state law, those drillers would be responsible? We think they would, yes. Okay, if you could get me the statute that you're referencing to ensure that that's the case, because apparently that's not the case for the existing legacy wells. The existing legacy wells were wells that were drilled before DEC had a regulatory program in place. The drilling has been going on in New York since the late 1800s. Okay, so so you're going to get back to me that there is actually state law and or regulation that it is not we, the state's we could responsibility. Things like liability insurance, um, we can require things through the permitting process that would address any um, problems at the well. We don't have a permitting process yet, so and we, I guess my question is, do we have state law that requires that it would be the obligation of the drillers to... Yes, we have, we have, the state law does require wells to be plugged. And would the end, it be their responsibility to do environmental cleanup caused by um, problems with their wells? under existing law or statute or regulation. We could come. Existing well is, re is required. A closure of, of a well is required under existing law. And mediation of environmental damage from a well is covered under existing law? Go ahead, Mark. You jump in. 
<laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, the, um, the, the plugging requirements in the existing law also have a financial security component, a bonding component, so each well is required to have uh, adequate resources to require the operator to plug, and if the operator doesn't plug, the DEC gets to do that. Uh, in terms of any other violations of the environmental conservation law, including Clean Water Act or Clean Air Act, the department has the authority to enforce those provisions. Quiet, everyone. I'm trying to listen. Sorry. And so the department has broad authority to enforce each of those laws as it relates to oil and gas activities, whether it's high volume or, or the traditional historic approach. Um, when Dr. Uh, Shaw was here last week, he uh, was referencing that there's an intention to have some kind of public health surveillance system in place that is some kind of, well, I, I want to be careful because he said it would be more the responsibility of DEC, but I'm not sure he said it would be totally DEC. Can you tell me what kind of public health surveillance system you have planned if we go forward with hydrofracturing and what we're survey surveilling? It really is the Department of Health's surveillance system. They have an existing surveillance system that monitors hospital data, emergency room data, and it's uh, what I've learned recently is it's very extensive. So they would apply that surveillance program if, if fracking were to go forward in a specific area then they would just use the existing system but focus it on that area to, to establish whatever the baseline is prior to frac, prior to HVF activity and then see if there's any change in that data as if HVF went forward. So it, it is a Department of Health surveillance program and um, that is not my area of expertise, but Dr. But what, does. It, what is your area of expertise would be environmental problems growing. Right. So I'm very concerned mm -hmm. in my 37 seconds left. Um, what's, for example, your model, your surveillance model for ensuring they're not alarmingly high methane emissions? Mm -hmm. Because there was a recent study done by the National Oceanic and Atm Atmospheric Administration talking about alarmingly high methane emissions from natural gas extraction. Um, do you have a system in place for measuring that and the staff to do so? We would have, um, we proposed uh, a very extensive monitoring program for emissions generally around a well site so that we can monitor existing conditions and conditions while a job is in progress. So where have you proposed that? in our SGIS. And have you estimated the cost for that and how much staffing is required for that? We have. And is there any funding for any of those functions in the proposed state budget this year? There is not. So we can assume that either nothing will be going forward or you won't be prepared to do that function in the coming 12 months? As I said over and over again, we are not going to permit anything we don't have funds to properly monitor and enforce. My time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. We've been joined by Assemblyman Chris Friend. Uh, next to, qu to question, uh, Assemblyman Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, you'll probably be pleased to hear that I'm not going to ask you questions uh, about the last few subjects. I've changed the subject here. Present. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask you about a couple of uh, couple of areas of things that are happening right now in New York State. Um, we have uh, the implementation of the sewage pollution right to know that was signed into law by Governor Cuomo, and there's there's confusion out there by some of the towns and counties that state that uh, this seems like an unfunded mandate. Uh, to your knowledge, uh, is it an unfunded mandate? Is it an unfunded mandate? <laughs> uh, it was an unfunded mandate to DEC, but one we willingly assumed. I mean, we, we are going to have to put out the regulations. Uh, there's going to have to be information posted on our website. So clearly there are, you know, impacts in, on staff. But no, what I mean is it's not an unfunded mandate to the, to the towns. All it is is simply a reporting requirement that doesn't require towns to buy sensors or do similar things uh, for programs. It specifically states in the legislation 
that uh, uh, upon knowledge uh, and upon discovery. Is that correct? Thank you. Assemblyman Engelbright. I have a, a couple of questions. Uh, in, in the DGIS, uh, there is uh, reference to the possibility of bringing uh, hyperfracking wastewater to uh, wastewater treatment sites on Long Island. I, I just wonder uh, whether this practice uh, how, how this is viewed by yourself. I, I'm imagining that a truck with wastewater going through the, the Bronx or Manhattan uh, might fall over, spill its radioactive contents into the, um, into the uh, subway system uh, and have a catastrophic uh, negative impact on uh, the uh, economic vitality of our largest state as well as the health of our population in its greatest concentration. And if a similar accident were to occur on the Long Island Expressway on the way to one of the ocean outfall uh, sites for sewage treatment, that uh, uh, the spillage uh, there would contaminate, uh, because the LIE runs down the groundwater divide, would contaminate our aquifer system both north and south of the groundwater divide. It just seems like a really um, important question to ask uh, your opinion on. The, uh, as far as I know, the SGIS doesn't specifically mention Long Island. Uh, it talks about the, the possibility of waste going to publicly owned treatment works anywhere in the state, but none, there is not a single POTW that is permitted to take high volume hydraulic fracturing wastewater today. Uh, if a driller uh, wanted to dispose in a POTW, that POTW would have to get a, uh, an approved pretreatment process permitted by the EPA, because that's not a delegated program in New York, and they would also need to, up, to upgrade and update their permit with DEC. In order to do that, they'd need to characterize the waste, they'd have to prove to us that they had a pretreatment process in place that could treat the waste uh, before and, they, and they'd have to demonstrate that they would meet all of their effluent standards, both federal and state. So the likelihood that uh, fracking wastewater will end up at a POTW, I'd say, is slight. But it's not, if someone went through all of those processes, they went and got their pretreatment program approved by EPA and DEC, and went through a permitting, the permitting process. They'd have, again, they'd have to characterize the waste. They'd have to demonstrate that that pretreatment process could handle the waste and that they'd meet all effluent standards. It's a very, very high bar. Would you support legislation that would clarify that we would not permit this practice? And uh, I don't take positions on legislation. All I can tell you though, if today someone wanted to dispose of it at a POTW, they would have uh, a extraordinarily high bar to uh, get to in order to demonstrate that they could stay in compliance with applicable federal and state permits. We had uh, recent testimony from the U.S. Geological Survey from uh, a groundwater specialist uh, by the name of John H. Williams, uh, quite uh, an authoritative uh, source. He spoke to the issue of valley fill aquifers in upstate New York. As you, as you probably know, a valley fill aquifer is uh, unconsolidated sediments sitting on bedrock left by glacial uh, processes of the past. And some of these aquifers are quite expansive, very deep. Some of the bedrock has been scoured to great depth, and the valley fill, in many cases, uh, is very deep and full of fresh water. Um, Mr. Williams' uh, testimony said that the valley fill aquifers, I'm quoting now, valley fill aquifers found in upstate New York are the most important aquifers in the state. 
if we look at the southern tier where shale gas development would be most likely to start, there are approximately 375 linear miles of valley fill aquifers that have not been mapped at a working scale. Thus, a substantial portion of the area where the highest potential for shale gas development uh, exists, there is a lack of basic hydrogeology. Um, that's one of the uh, issues that he raised. He also raised an issue on faults. He said that, quote, faults are of critical importance and may cause the most abrupt changes in formation properties, distribution, and potential effect uh, for fracking. Uh, he indicated that uh, Dr. Jacoby, who is a noted professor of structural geology at the University of Buffalo, has studied faults in New York's Appalachian Basin and concluded that they're much more problematic than previously suspected. And so my question to you, we don't have adequate mapping of faults. Um, we don't have adequate mapping, according to the USGS, on a working scale of valley fill aquifers in the most likely uh, area for uh, hydrofracking. Uh, and so I ask you, how do you reconcile this with uh, the almost complete absence of uh, uh, addressing these issues in the DGIS. Um, in the SDIS, um, the, you know, the, the, the regulatory name of those valley uh, flow aquifers are principal and primary aquifers, which I know you're familiar with. And we, uh, at least in the draft, had proposed a uh, ban on drilling in primary aquifers, which are used by uh, municipalities around the state as a, their primary water supply and that for principal aquifers uh, you would a, a driller would have to do a site-specific environmental impact statement uh, if they wanted to drill in a principal aquifer which is used by many fewer people than primary aquifers are and those aquifers are well mapped um, I think you can probably see where they are if you go to our website but I'm, I can be happy to share the data we have on where they're located. Um, industry um, has, just to give you the other side, th their, their perspective is we ought to allow drilling within both primary and principal aquifers. They've done it in other places. Um, so I hear obviously both sides of that equation, but we've taken a very aggressive posture as it goes, as it goes, as it applies to um, principal and primary aquifers. And on, uh, on faults, um, I can't uh, cite you chapter and verse, but where there's any evidence of faults, that you know, um, there are seismic tools that could be applied for drilling in areas which do indicate where faults are. And I think, um, again, uh, when they, uh, when we would require seismic testing, um, I can't recall specifically, but in those areas where we think it's of concern, we can require testing before drilling occurs. So I think we, ha we have addressed at least both those areas, and I'd be happy to go back and, and uh, see what else we have, particularly with seismology, because I cause you can't recall off the top of my head the, everything that's in the SGIS. The logic that you just put forward uh, for doing further investigation before going forward it seems to me is good logic, but that it should be applied to the 375 linear miles of valley fill aquifers before this whole process is even given a green light to proceed. But thank you for your, your comments this morning. Thank, thank you. you. Sure. Thank you. Assemblyman Oaks. Hi. Uh, just to, uh, to let you know that we've been joined by uh, Ray Walter, Assemblyman from uh, Amherst. All righty. Assemblyman Fahey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good morning. Excuse good morning. Me. Commissioner, thank you for being here. Sorry I had to step out, so I may have missed a couple of things. I have two uh, what I think are pretty quick questions. One, and, and if this was asked before, please let me know, is just a quick staffing issue. 
um, having talked to a lot of people in the community as, a, as one of the new members here, heard lots about the um, staffing issues at the department. I, if I understand the uh, governor's proposal is essentially for level of funding. Um, it, it, any comments, if, if you, again, if you haven't been asked this question on this, this issue and in the, you know, how is the department going to be proactive on so many of the issues facing it if, if, uh, if they continue to uh, face these staff shortages? And again, if you've already been asked this on uh, staffing issues, with the, especially among professional staff within the yeah, department. Yeah, I'd be happy to, to uh, address it. We, um, you know, all staff reductions have occurred across the state, obviously. Yeah. We're, not, we're not unique. Uh, we, we're down probably 20% from where the department was several years ago. Um, and we've had to, we've had to adjust a lot of, in a lot of different ways. One of the, one of the big initiatives that I have is to move to e-business and we have a significant commitment from the governor in the budget to bring us into the, at least the modern era of the computer age so that we can, we don't have uh, air engineers inputting data from applicants by hand, which happens today. If it came in electronically and can be managed electronically, then they, you know, they can turn to higher tasks and not waste a lot of time doing stuff manually. Um, likewise, we've instituted this lean process where we have a now have a dedicated person going through each division of the agency looking for ways that we can simplify, use staff more efficiently. Not that I think all of the divisions have been very creative about how they do things and they have, they have adjusted. Um, I, a lot of uh, how I gauge the department is doing is on how many complaints we get from uh, the regulated community, from the not-for-profit community about where we're falling short. And I think, you know, in general, we've been doing we've been doing pretty well. We get our permits out on time. We um, we cover inspections, and you know, thankfully, you know, the department saw a this, you know steep decline in staff since Governor Cuomo took office. It has been maintained. We have not uh, suffered staff cuts for the last several years, which is good news. We've stabilized. Uh, we're, you know, we're getting accustomed to doing things uh, more efficiently, and we're constantly striving to improve, you know, our performance. Thank you. Uh, the, the next question is, I, I come off of a school board, so schools are a particular uh, interest to me. My understanding is, is that 68 of our public schools across the state have uh, either active or abandoned oil or, or natural gas wells on, on the school property. And I understand that New York allows um, the gas wells on the property. Um, however, there is some understanding that um, the invasive, uh, the, the practice of high volume hydraulic fracking would not be allowed on school grounds. Um, if that's true though, can you just comment for me, if you will, or give us a little more on, on the proposed buffer zones uh, on, you know, on those schools in particular and, and what you propose uh, to do and how you would distance um, uh, that, that ability from our school property, especially with, uh, with those good few dozen schools. Thank you. Um, a current setback? The, the current setback from structures like schools and uh, public buildings is 500 feet. And we are, that's the existing setback and we don't allow high volume hydraulic fracturing to occur yet in New York so that that activity you know doesn't hasn't happened on school grounds or elsewhere uh, we are uh, I think proposing uh, an increase to a thousand feet in the current draft of the SGIS from schools okay this is one I'm sure I'll, I'd welcome another conversation as I begin to learn these issues really appreciate your comments yep, thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, next is um, Assemblywoman Lifton for to close, actually. And we have with us, uh, join us, Assemblywoman Hooper. Yes. Yes. To, did you say to close? Yes. Mr. Chair? Um, just two quick questions, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, I've lost track. We've been in a number of hearings together. One hearing a year or so ago, I asked if there was a demonstration project uh, that, I said there were rumors of a demonstration project uh, in the southern tier. Um, and I said, is there a plan? Do you, are you aware of a plan to roll out uh, uh, gas drilling in the southern tier with some sort of smaller project? You said no, you were not aware of such a plan. Um, 
Next day, there was a press report. There was indeed such a plan being put forward, I think, by Shenango County that went to the hydrofracking panel, uh, of which you, which you chair, no? Um, but I, I recall so, the press announcement, but it, it was just that. I read it in the You were press. not, a, a year ago, you were, there was, that plan wasn't presented to the hydrofracking plan, panel for um, possible review by that panel a year ago? The, 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 uh, for, for a few the representative and from Tenango may, may have suggested it at a, an advisory committee meeting. I'm, I'm not. Yeah. Um, Mark, Mark just reminded me that we had uh, the, the county came in and made a presentation about all the things that the county were doing to prepare for high volume hydraulic fracturing. We spent the, you know, most of the session on the things that they had done on the county level to prepare a plan to you know, anticipate the activity. Commissioner, is there now a plan to roll out uh, 10, 10 to 40 wells? So, you know, we keep hearing, again, a lot of discussion about that. Is there a current plan at DEC uh, to, or, other, or somewhere else on the local level that you're, anything that you're aware of to begin to roll out drilling in the southern tier? A, a demonstration project is one of the alternatives that's considered in the alternatives chapter of the SGIS, along with six other alternatives, I think. And let me, if I could just finish um, with this. I, you say you've been looking at other states. Um, we have two, of course, looking especially closely at Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if you're aware, but uh, I'm told, and from pretty reliable sources and up close sources, that there are 400 families in one county alone that have been, uh, had, had water delivered to them for the last two years. They've been living on delivered water for two years, 400 families in one county, Washington County, Pennsylvania. That's just one huge concern that I have out of Pennsylvania. The, there are lots of concerns, of course, and there are people all over Pennsylvania with sure. uh, water hurt. We don't, we don't have good data because they're all signing non-disclosed agreements, of course, in order to get that water. Also, Pennsylvania, as you may know, passed Act 13. Uh, Pennsylvania law that put a, a part of which put a gag on doctors to talk about health concerns, to talk about people's symptoms, to talk about other, to talk, to share information with other doctors and to try to uh, get a better handle on what's happening with their patients. I'm greatly concerned when I hear that kind of thing. To me, uh, this industry has a record of, uh, of incompetence, malfeasance, and in the case of uh, Pennsylvania Law 13, where they put a gag order on doctors, which of course doctors are in court fighting, you know, that it's against their Hippocratic oath to not try to do the best they can by their patients. Um, so to me that's a corruption, and I assume it's the industry, not the citizens of the state of Pennsylvania who lobby their legislature to say doctors can't talk to each other and they can't share information. I assume that push came from the industry. And that makes me extremely uncomfortable in terms of inviting this industry into New York State. Do you feel uncomfortable, Commissioner, when you hear that kind of thing out of Pennsylvania to say we ought to allow this industry into the state of New York? That level of, of corruption that we've seen there, and that's just one instance, uh, Commissioner. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable. Does it make you uncomfortable to hear these kind of things out of Pennsylvania? I'm uncomfortable anytime I hear about corporate irresponsibility, whether it's with regards to this industry or any other. To me, these are disqualifiers. You know, to say doctors can't talk to each other. This is just unheard of, isn't it, in our, in our state, in our country? Um, it, it, to me, it says these people don't want us to know what's really going on with this industry and what impact it has on real people in their real lives every day, and especially on water and human health. This, the industry isn't safe, in my view, Commissioner. What, where are you on your overall thinking about that? When you look at Pennsylvania and everything we're hearing, how do you feel about it? You say you're uncomfortable. What do you think about doctor's gag order in Pennsylvania? Why are they doing that? Why do you, when you I, hear that, I feel that, the same way about that, doctor's Mr. gag orders as you do, Assemblywoman. It's, and and, how, do you, and it, how does it make you assess the industry when you hear something like that? How do you feel about saying, let's invite them into New York? Listen, I'm afraid that anything I say here will be taking, taken out of context. I, <laughs> case, case in point. Um, I, wa I want to hear I, your answer, Commissioner. I, I, with all. I don't think it's fair in any sector to, 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 be, to categorically condemn everybody that's in an industry for the behavior of some companies. Clearly, 
some companies have invo have in have not been responsible when it comes to high volume hydraulic fracturing. You could say that with regard to lots of different industries. There's uh, you know charlatans in the healthcare industry. There's you know charlatans in the uh, petroleum industry generally. Well, if the question is, can you properly regulate them? Can you force responsible companies to operate in New York? And that's an open question. Uh, what I'm concerned about is whether or not someone could operate in, in New York in a way that protects public health and the environment. That's my concern. And again, have, again, Commissioner, with all due respect, I don't think the state of Pennsylvania, as corrupt as it clearly is around this industry, um, at, is responding to one rogue company. They are responding, I believe, to the industry as a whole that wants to put a kibosh on, on real information getting out to people. Uh, I, I, don't, I can't believe the state of Pennsylvania listened to one or two businesses, one or two mom and pop operations and said, sure, we'll agree to a gag order on doctors. That doesn't seem credible to me. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner, very much. You're welcome. Are you going to stay here till 5 o'clock tonight with us? Not. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Folks. Hold it. All right. Folks, you're making it hard for me to call a 10 o'clock person. If you want to come back at 6, you can continue what you're doing. Okay, good. Rose Harvey, Commissioner, New York State Office of Parks, Recreation, and Historic Preservation. Ms. Harvey? Ms. Harvey. So that's his testimony. I hope you enjoyed it. And just a note, the hall was packed and there was overflow into the hallways. And of course, as always, the most important thing is, what's your opinion? Take care.